Today, we're talking about Mark Zuckerberg getting injured while seemingly training for his possible upcoming showdown with Elon Musk, a college athlete losing more than his future career over a love triangle, a Connecticut man was arrested after being found with millions of dollars worth of psychedelic mushrooms, and more, all in today's episode of The Insight Hour. What's up, fam? Hope you had a fantastic weekend. Before we start, help a guy out and smash that like and subscribe button, and uh, join us here on our path to partnership. Now, Alice, let's get going with that Zuckerberg story first. Mark Zuckerberg has suffered a torn ACL while sparring, an injury that has led to surgery. Despite the setback, he remains optimistic, expressing gratitude towards his medical team and support from his community. His involvement in martial arts isn't new. He's been training for some time and even won medals in a jiu-jitsu tournament. This incident comes amid playful banter with Tesla CEO Elon Musk about a potential cage match. Well, it looks like Zuck's been getting his jujitsu on and blew his ACL to smithereens. You'd think with all those billions he could afford some knee pads and a personal trainer. But, hey, sometimes you gotta feel the mat burn to know you're alive. It's clearly some primal instinct that I would know nothing about. Now, he's all gung-ho about some epic comeback like he's Rocky going up against Ivan Drago. My money's on Dana White egging him on, cause you'd know he'd eat that shit up. A Zuck vs. Musk paper do you throw down is probably worth more than a Pacquiao vs. Mayweather one. They just appeal to more people. And I'm sure a lot more people would like to see one of these men get punched out. I mean, just imagine it. Two tech titans in the octagon, duking it out in a battle for the ages. You like my fighting stances? It's basically Facebook versus Twitter meets UFC Fight Night. The social network versus the boring company. Boards and billions clashing in the ultimate show of alpha male swagger. I hate to say it, but it's kind of musty TV. Now, let's get a little analytical, shall we? On one hand, it's kind of nice to see Zuck crack a smile and show he can take a hit, even if it's to his ACL. It's in line with his self-deprecating humor that we see from time to time. But on the other hand, the whole celebrity fight club thing reeks of uber-rich dudes distracting us peasants with Hollywood flair and Turkish showmanship, then profiting shitloads of money off of it, like modern gladiators battling for entertainment while Rome burns. But let's be real, when the pay-per-views go live, you know we're all going to be tuning in, even if it's just for the schadenfreude. There's something irresistible about seeing the masters of the universe stripped down and exposed. So what deep wisdom can be gleamed from all this? Well, for starters, that the higher you climb, the harder you fall. Pride cometh before a torn ACL. Also, look before you kick, lest you hyperextend your own knee instead of your opponent's face. However you slice it, this fight club drama just has us all thirsty for more. It's just fight after fight after fight. YouTuber, CEO, YouTuber. I mean, like, will Zuck make a triumphant comeback? Can he take on Musk without shattering his other knee? Or will he be exposed for what he likely is? A coding nerd masquerading as an athlete. Well, grab the popcorn, because this train wreck's just getting started. Now, I gotta admit, I'm torn on the whole trend. Part of me wants to see what these geeks are made of in the ring, but another part wonders if it's all just smoke and mirrors. Yes. Yes, it is. Are we really witnessing prime athletic achievement here? Or is it just more useless entertainment and spectacle to distract us peons from the real issues of the day? It's that one. It's, it's definitely that one. I mean, let's be honest. Coding Python scripts doesn't exactly make for a killer cage fighting skill. I mean, this isn't Mortal Kombat. wonder what their finish me moves look, look like. Hmm. But, like, I know I'm gonna watch it. You know, it's like a 20-car NASCAR pileup meets Jersey Shore. Like, you shouldn't look. You know you shouldn't look, but you just can't turn away. It's so good. And even if it ends up being a farce, like, maybe we'll still learn something. Like, patience when our idols disappoint. Or humility when the masters of the universe get taken down a peg. I don't know. But one thing's for sure. When that opening bell dings, all philosophical debates are going out the window. This Luddite is ready for some hypnotic violence. Let's get ready to rumble! Carl Hens Belliard, a college basketball player, was tragically shot and killed while driving. The suspect, 18-year-old Pena Canella, has been charged with murder and pleaded not guilty. Belliard will be remembered as a, quote, happy kid who was passionate about basketball and had a bright future ahead of him. Now, from what we understand, Belliard, a promising college basketball player with dreams of making it in the NBA, was caught in a deadly love triangle that sadly cost him his life. As we process the devastating loss, we're left grappling with the usual suspects of questions. Things like what can be done to prevent similar tragedies like this in the future and the ease of access to firearms for teenagers. Though there are no easy answers, Belliard's death is just another example of the urgent need for a society to address issues like domestic violence and conflict resolution. Teens can be, let's say, over-emotional at times, especially when it comes to their partners. 
Bellier's. A beloved son, teammate, and friend is gone now, leaving grief and pain in his wake. So let's honor Bellier's memory not by fixating on the circumstances of his death, but by celebrating the vibrance of his life. He was a talented athlete who lit up the basketball court and brought joy to his teammates and community. Another young life is gone now, and we have to share in the collective sense of loss. But from adversity, there's also an opportunity to grow by facing hard truths. Maybe mourn Billiard with grace, reflect with nuance, and however difficult, move forward with purpose. A 21-year-old Connecticut man, Weston Soul, has been charged with running a large-scale psilocybin mushroom operation out of his home. All right, so our fungal visionary, Weston Soul, saw an opportunity that isn't just yet mainstream, therapeutic use of psychedelic mushrooms. Now, as it turns out, he wasn't just dabbling in a few magic mushrooms underneath the heat lamp in his closet. No, we're talking a full-scale underground operation with over 40 pounds of psilocybin producing fungi. This guy went from amateur mycologist to Tony Sopranos meets Walter White overnight. Turns out he had converted his entire Connecticut home into a labyrinth of grow rooms with an elaborate setup of lights, humidifiers, and temperature controls. I mean, the man wasn't messing around. But in his enthusiasm, Enthusiasm, Weston forgot a key setup, making sure what you're cultivating is actually legal. I know, sucks. When the cop showed up at his not-so-humble psychedelic abode, Weston tried playing it cool at first. He claimed he was just having some gourmet mushrooms for personal use. Uh, yeah. 40 pounds worth. Guess what? The authorities didn't buy it. Once they came back with a warrant and investigated further, it was pretty clear that this was no casual culinary hobby. Weston's $200,000 home had been completely transformed into a psilocybin production facility, full of equipment typically reserved for sophisticated cabinet growing houses. Clearly, this was a full-blown business operation. The gig was up, and Seoul's lucrative shroom venture evaporated like, well, a mushroom club. Authorities estimate the street value of the psychedelic mushrooms found around $8.5 million. The operation was discovered after a tip led the DEA's Hartford Task Force to Seoul's residence, where they found mushrooms in various stages of growth and equipment typical of a drug factory. As stated, Seoul initially denied the illegality of his operation, but later conceded that the mushrooms were indeed psilocybin. He now faces charges of possession with intent to sell and distribute narcotics and operation of a drug factory. Now, Let's engage in a little thought experiment, shall we? What if Weston had set up shop in California instead of Connecticut? Recent legislation in certain California districts has opened the door for decriminalizing psychedelics. Oakland and Santa Ana have already passed laws deprioritizing prosecution for using or growing ethnogenic plants and fungi. Could Weston have been a trailblazer rather than a criminal if he had only looked left coast instead of east? Perhaps in an alternative reality, Weston is making headlines as an entrepreneur of the leading edge rather than a cautionary tale. But timing is everything. By jumping the gun ahead of the legal curve, Weston's story becomes one of ambition exceeding legality. Still, you gotta give him points for boldness and commitment to a shroomery vision. Not everyone has the guts to turn their home into a psychedelic lab. The moral here is that patience and discretion are virtues when navigating legal gray areas. Weston's better off keeping any future fungi for all small and humble until the law catches up with the times. Who knows? In another 5-10 to 10 years, we could see psychedelic dispensaries right alongside cannabis shops. Or inside them. But for now, his wings got singed by flying a little too close to the sun. A promising career in ethnobotany cut short. Let's hope Wesson learns from this magical misadventure. When in doubt, wait it out. Up next, we have a health alert involving a recall of children's fruit puree pouches due to potential lead contamination. Parents are advised to avoid certain apple cinnamon products and seek testing for children who may have consumed them. All right, it's time to get to the core of this fruit snack fail. So we've got a real debacle here with lead-laced apple cinnamon pouches that are leaving a rotten taste in parents' mouth. Schnucks, Weiss Markets, and Wannabanner are yanking products faster than hot potato on fire. A wise move when you've got toxic heavy metals on the ingredients list. You know, that's kind of a surefire way to spoil your consumer's appetite. Now you might be asking yourself, how does this happen in the first place? How does lead end up literally packaged and sold to families? Well, there are some theories out there that it may have seeped in through contaminated soil irrigation. Perhaps it's an issue higher up in the supply chain. With the process or manufacturing equipment tainted with lead particles and residue. Or it could be a contamination during transport or packing. However, it's not getting lead and food paired just about as well as orange juice and toothpaste. Unless you're into that. Not shaming. Yeah, that's a lie. I am shaming because that's fucking nasty. Anyway. Speculating the origins doesn't do as much good now. The priority is protecting children's health and holding these companies accountable. Parents are understandably upset that these supposedly healthy snacks contain ingredients that could lead to lead poisoning and lifelong neurological issues if consumed regularly. Not exactly the kind of transparency and care we'd expect from our baby food brands. So what comes next? The companies need to get serious about how this happened under their watch and honest with the parents about the situation. Streamline food safety protocols. 
communicate openly, and ensure that produce is traceable from field to pouch. And if these precautions and quality checks aren't prioritized, well, I'm sure they can expect more sour feedback from disappointed consumers and regulators alike. I feel like I shouldn't have to say this, but when it comes to caring for kids, what we feed them matters immensely. Lead wreaks havoc on growing minds and bodies with implications that can last a lifetime if unchecked. So we've got to demand better from these people. Vote with your dollars and voice for authentic health conscious practices. Lead in snacks is an absolute no-go, and if companies won't clean up their supply chains, it's time to take our businesses elsewhere. Our mini and mighty ones deserve transparency, accountability, and the very best nutritionment. This fruit fiasco leads a bad taste, but also an opportunity to cultivate some positive change so all ingredients can feel good going in. You know, while we're on the topic of metals in our food... Tyson Foods has issued a recall for a batch of their dino-shaped chicken nuggets due to the discovery of metal pieces in the product. As it would seem, we have a prehistoric predicament on our hands. Tyson's dino nuggets, usually a kid's favorite, not a grown man's favorite. Kid's favorite. But they taste so much better, I don't know why. Have been contaminated with an unexpected ingredient straight out of the Cretaceous period. Bits of metal. Bum, 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 bum. Shocker. Not exactly the kind of iron you want to be in your diet. Now, any nugget hoarders out there with a bag with a best buy date of 9424 need to dump that dino haul. Pronto. Tyson's recalling about 30,000 pounds of these Jurassic gems after reports of oral injury have surfaced. Talk about a blast from the past. It's the Bronze Age up in this bitch, baby. Finding random metal shrapnel in your food is always alarming. But in our T-Rex and Triceratops nuggets? Why, Tyson? Why? And here people are afraid of someone messing with their candy given out at Halloween. Looks like you can't trust the big companies, can you? And maybe your neighbor isn't the bad guy. Makes you sort of wonder how many of these foreign artifacts slip past quality control in the first place. While Tyson is taking action, this gnarly gaffe raises a few quite concerning questions. For starters, are we looking at an isolated incident, or is this just the tip of the contaminated iceberg? The people have a right to know what's going on in their prehistoric protein patties, damn it! It's time to take off the kid gloves and demand some dynamite transparency yep 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 look the bottom line is that when we serve up dinner it needs to be free of non-edible surprises the only mystery i should have to wonder about is how they pack so much flavor into one nugget next time let's keep the recipe simple just poultry seasoning and i don't know like ketchup or something no ancient artifacts please but seriously any amount of metal shrapnel or lead lurking in food is unacceptable or at least i think it should be but i could be wrong you tell me what you think. Clearly, we need better eyes on these companies and precautions to catch stuff like this before it ends up on our family's dinner tables. I mean, at least preferably. No one should have to check for fillings in their chicken nuggets. So chew on this, friends. We deserve better quality control across the board. Whether it's nuggets, snacks, juices, or pouches. Let's advocate for ourselves, damn it. Set better and clearer standards than monitor the fuck out of them. We've evolved past minerals and metals in our meals. And on that, we're gonna call it for the day. We had a bunch of new subs join us over the weekend, so I just wanted to say, hello, welcome to the show. Glad you found us. Be sure to let me know your thoughts on anything we talked about today. And until next time, stay weird, stay safe, and I'll see you on Wednesday.